Tonight, a job crunch for younger Canadians. Why students and teenagers face an uncertain future. A persistent increase in unemployed workers um, are actually new graduates. New hiring plummets amid high interest rates and economic uncertainty. It is so frustrating. I want to work. Plus, the solar show of a lifetime. The last time a total solar eclipse was visible anywhere in Canada was in 1979. Eyewitnessing history with the right protection for those eyes. Millions of people are going to get to see it. And Lego mania on the rock. I'm making a hammer. A look at Newfoundlanders' passion for the bright bricks. Lego kind of forces you to slow down and think. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Reporting tonight, Todd Vander Hayden. Good evening. It could be a rough spring and summer for students and teenagers looking for work in our country. New data from Statistics Canada showing that they are having the hardest time getting a job. It comes as the unemployment rate has gone up to the worst level in more than two years nationwide. Companies just aren't hiring like they used to, in part due to high interest rates. CTV's Kamal Karamali has more. On a fast and furious search. It is so frustrating. I want to work. 21-year-old Claire Fitzpatrick frantic to find a job, sending out dozens of applications. I have not heard back from 90% of those anything positive or negative. For those employers who did respond, what did they say? Mostly we are not pursuing you as a candidate. She's part of a growing number of youth. Canada-wide struggling to land work. New numbers show the unemployment rate is now over 6%, driven up by students who can't get hired, either while in school or shortly after graduating. This is actually the first time that we've seen this significant of an increase in the Canadian unemployment rate without it being driven primarily by rising layoffs. The youth unemployment rate rose another 1%. Now a total of 12.6% of the youth population don't have a job, which is the highest since September of 2016, not including the pandemic years. Those between the ages of 15 to 24 seeing the highest rate in unemployment among all age groups, post-secondary students, other students, and all youth under the age of 20, making up roughly half of the unemployed, driving up Canada's jobless rate. Analysts say high borrowing costs are really weighing down on businesses who now don't want to hire. A lot of employers just don't have the spaces open right now. They say uh, either spots have already been filled or they're just not opening up this summer. All of that might ease once the Bank of Canada announces an interest rate cut, allowing businesses some flexibility to bring more staff on board. But that rate cut may not happen until this summer. Todd. All right. Thanks very much, Kamal. Kamal Karamali reporting. Many people shop for groceries on the weekend, maybe you're one of them, but with high prices in the stores, new data shows more Canadians are blaming big grocery chains for the soaring costs. And there's also the question of why there isn't more competition in the Canadian market. CTV's Colton Prale has more on the affordability crunch and the political consequences. Big business profits remain under the spotlight, especially at the grocery store. We also see another record being broken, record profits for corporate grocery stores. New polling shows 32% of Canadians blame grocery stores for rising food prices, more than any other contributor. Some economists say that blame is misplaced. Improving foreign worker programs, training more truck drivers, harmonizing trucking regulations, all of those have an identifiable cost impact on increasing the price of food. We want to accelerate the pace of home construction to levels not seen since the end of the Second World War. While Justin Trudeau turns to new housing announcements to tackle the affordability crunch Canadians are feeling, his opponents are hammering his government over the country's lack of competition and the high cost of living. Monopoly problem is threatening Canada. It's threatening the free market economy and it's threatening Canada's future. Last week, the NDP pushed for an inquiry into oil and gas price gouging, something the Competition Bureau continues to monitor. To the extent they can sort of frame this as a government failure and I think at the same time propose something that actually would be effective in response, 
um, I think it could be part of uh, of what is growing. Uh, a growing problem for, for the government. Ottawa has made progress on the issue, updating the Competition Act in December, but experts are challenging the government to do more. Price regulation, for example, in areas like housing uh, or in energy. Uh, other countries have tried those and found that they, in fact, worked uh, more directly and more effectively. The Liberals are pushing back against the latest attacks, criticizing the Conservatives for slowing up legislation that would further amend the Competition Act, something they say would have a direct impact on affordability and monopolies across the country. Todd. All right, Colton Prail in Ottawa. Thanks, Colton. And the Trudeau government also feeling the heat over the recent carbon tax increase. The Premier of Nova Scotia, Tim Houston, the latest provincial leader, to say it should be eliminated. Houston joins five other premiers now from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador, who want an emergency meeting with the Prime Minister on the tax. The six premiers, as well as the federal Conservatives, want the government to scrap the tax amid tough economic times for Canadians. Justin Trudeau is so far refusing to meet. One of the world's highest profile environmentalists was taken to police custody today, not once, but twice. Greta Thunberg was in the Netherlands as part of a major demonstration near a highway. It happened in the Dutch city of The Hague, and after getting hauled away for the second time, the Swedish environmentalist was then driven off in a police van with other protesters. The highway has been a frequent site of protests, demanding an end to subsidies for the oil and gas sector. There was a different kind of demonstration today in Israel, where thousands of people took to the streets to demand a ceasefire in Gaza. <laughs> Demonstrators say time is running out for the hostages taken by Hamas on October the 7th. They also want Israel to hold elections, saying Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has to go. Tomorrow will be six months since the start of the war between Israel and Hamas. And it all comes following the grim news that another Israeli hostage has been found dead. Israeli troops recovering the body of Elad Katzir in southern Gaza. Comes three months after he pleaded for his release in a video that was issued by his kidnappers. The Israeli military saying the 47-year-old farmer was killed by Islamic Jihad. At least 35 hostages have died during their captivity in Gaza. Meantime, another tense protest in the city of Toronto today over the war in Gaza. One person was arrested at a pro-Palestinian rally as tensions are simmering between protesters and the Toronto Police Department. Big crowds were marching through the streets, chanting for an immediate ceasefire. Both sides are blaming each other for growing hostilities. Protesters have also accused police of using excessive force. Toronto police defending their stance, saying demonstrators have become more aggressive and police will not hesitate to make arrests if warranted. And we're getting an update on the crisis in Haiti. The federal government saying its last evacuation flight out of the country is scheduled for this weekend. It's the last chance for Canadians who want to leave to get out on one of those planes. So far, more than 250 Canadian citizens, permanent residents and relatives have escaped Haiti, the country dealing with a series of overlapping crises, from violent gangs that have taken over much of the capital to a government that is barely functioning and a growing humanitarian emergency with a shortage of both food and medicine. Oh, to Florida, where there was a frightening confrontation inside of a bar in Miami, turned into a shootout with police on the streets, leaving at least two people dead and seven others injured. A man fatally shot a security guard who was trying to break up a fight. Police officers then jumped in, eventually killing the shooter. Innocent bystanders were also caught in the crossfire. For many of us, it will be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, a solar eclipse on Monday that will be seen by millions of Canadians living in the eastern half of our country, tracking from Mexico diagonally up across the United States and then into Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes. With less than two days to go, it's now all about the preparations, where to see it and how to protect your eyes. CTV's Adrian Gobriel has more. A celestial phenomenon for the ages. Canadians across the country are expected to take in this Monday's solar eclipse. And as excitement builds, so do questions about safety. Millions of people are going to get to see it. According to NASA, there's some simple guidelines to follow if you'll be viewing the extraordinary event. Always view the sun through eclipse glasses or a handheld solar viewer during the partial eclipse phase. 
You can view the eclipse directly without eye protection only when there's a total eclipse, which is when the moon completely covers the sun. That can last a matter of seconds or minutes, depending on where you're located. You actually have to take away your glasses because otherwise you're going to miss the show and it will be beautiful. So for those few minutes, you're clear <laughs> to look at the sun. Though as soon as the sun reappears, that's your cue to pull on the protective eyewear. For those who aren't careful, this ophthalmologist stresses that you could develop what's called a macular hole. You will have a large blind spot in your central vision and that's not what you want to have. Eclipse gazers will also want to make sure there aren't any scratches on the lens of their eye protection. With so many planning to pull out their smartphones to record the historic moment high above, concerns have been raised about the damage that can be done to your device, though experts say you have little to be worried about. If you want to be sure, you can put the, your eclipse glasses in front of the lens, but I can tell you it, it is okay for your phone. If you have a special camera, though, with a big lens, then the energy is concentrated onto the detector of your camera and it can heat it up. Another safe way to view the eclipse, the screen on your device. Your phone isn't going to produce any dangerous light for your eyes. For those going about their Monday, there's no real additional safety concerns. Similar to a normal day, don't stare at the sun. And if you're driving during the eclipse, keep your eyes on the road. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. The first female lieutenant governor of British Columbia is being remembered. Iona Cabanolo died earlier this week at the age of 91. She was first appointed to the role in 2001 and served until 2007. Throughout her life, Cabanolo was a big advocate for women's rights, the environment and indigenous issues. She actually started as a city councillor in Prince Rupert, B.C. back in 1966 and later she was elected as a federal liberal in the 1974 election. She also served as Minister of Amateur Sport in the government of then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. A day of remembrance in Saskatchewan as well, where the community of Humboldt is marking six years since a bus crash killed 16 people, many of them teenage hockey players. It happened when the driver of a semi-truck smashed into the bus at a highway intersection. Having to learn to live a new life with a spinal cord injury has changed my life and I know that everyone affected uh, changed their lives as well. So it's about finding that open door, that next opportunity and always pushing forward. I mean, every one of the survivors and all, all the families together, I mean, they've done incredible things thus far and I'm just so proud of them all. Communities nationwide are hosting events tomorrow for what's known as Green Shirt Day. It's held in support of organ donation. The driver of that truck is still fighting deportation back to India. Two Canadian basketball stars are soaring to incredible heights, both at the NCAA March Madness Tournament. At 7 feet 4 inches, Zach Eady is impossible to miss, and Aaliyah Edwards from Kingston shooting up the ranks as well. CTV's Tony Grace now on the future of Canadian hoops. Eady will go at Burns now. The jump hook is good. At 7 foot 4, he's a towering presence. And tonight, Toronto's Zach Eady and the Purdue Boilermakers... Purdue headed to the national championship game. Booked their ticket to the NCAA men's final with a win over North Carolina State. Whoever comes out of this next game is going to be a great team, but we're going to lock in on game plan and execute. Edie's been smashing records and accumulating accolades, this week becoming the first back-to-back -back player of the year in 40 years. To be able to bounce back and, and accomplish things that we've had up to this point, uh, it's, it's been uh, probably the favorite, my favorite year I've ever lived in. A remarkable run for someone who grew up playing hockey and baseball. Good job, Wilson. Until landing at this Toronto Basketball Academy in his teens. His trajectory is like phenomenal. It is literally a movie. Where coach Vidal Messiah watched it all begin. My sister actually spotted him, sent us a photo. My nephew approached him. Uh, my nephew told him, my uncle's going to change your life. We got his phone number, ended up connecting, and now Zach's in the Final Four. Incredible. It's an incredible story. So is the story of Kingston, Ontario's Elia Edwards, whose Connecticut Huskies were one win away from the women's final before dropping a nail-biter last night. Unfortunately, we just didn't leave this game with the dub. But she did leave it, savoring other wins. Being proud of, of the team and proud of how we game in game out just continue to to believe in each another and and lean on one another and now poised for big things in the wnba draft a week from monday it'll be a quick turnaround for her to get ready for that and she's projected to go top five 
if not top five, then in the first round. Edie could also go early in the NBA draft in June, and both are expected to make Canada's Olympic teams this summer. It takes one person to kind of see it. I'm lucky I saw it. The next couple of months filled with dates that could represent big steps on those exciting journeys, and which could provide even more inspiration to the next generation of stars. Tony Grace, CTV News, Toronto. All right, when we come back, buying a house full of memories. It really showed that the house was loved and that it had um, just such a history that I was looking for. A new homeowner finds more than she imagined. Plus, a celebration of Lego in St. John's, how Newfoundlanders are building some amazing things. Oh, welcome back. Great story from Saskatchewan now about a first time home buyer in Regina. The house she's moved into has got a rich history and now it's connecting different generations through art, mementos and friendship. CTV's Allison Bamford has this inside look. It was a perfect match when Deanne Shildroth first laid eyes on this quaint 1940s house. I always said that if I ever get a house, I just want a square with a triangle on top. But it's what was left inside that made the four walls feel like a home. Dear Deanne, I write to you on this vintage paper that belonged to Cabled. Keepsakes from the previous owner, newspaper clippings, a watercolor painting, and a photo album showcasing a lifetime's worth of memories. It really showed that the house was loved and that it had... Um, just such a history that I was looking for. The house belonged to Kay and Cliff Boult. The couple moved in back in 1949 and for nearly 50 years made it their home. The home itself was always inviting, always welcome. When Kay passed away, she left the house to her close friend, Janet Craig. And she said, please take care of it. Craig rented it out for more than 20 years before putting it on the market. Well, little did I know that the first person that looked at it would end up buying it. And she always wore a hat. Now meeting face to face for the first time, both believe there was a grander plan at play. I think this house picked her. Shildroth never met Kay, but the two share an uncanny connection. Kay was born May 17th, the same day as Shildroth's mother. She was an artist, she sewed, and she loved to garden, just like Shildroth. So I really feel like... We're kind of kindred spirits. And when Craig went to clean up the house, she found a dime on the floor dated 1980, the same year Shildroth was born. And I know that was a sign from Kay. A sign they say it was all meant to be. Shildroth finding her perfect home and gaining an unexpected friend along the way. And I am going to keep in touch with Deanne. I am going to pop in and say, hey, I'm here. Let's have a cup of tea because that's what Kay would have done. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. All right, still ahead for us, a solar eclipse in our backyard. Connecting Indigenous culture to the wonders of the universe. More than 30 million people will be in the path of Monday's solar eclipse. It's a rare celestial phenomenon that shows us the power of the cosmos. But for Indigenous communities in Canada, it can take on a different significance. In tonight's Indigenous Circle, CTV's Donna Sound has more on the meaning behind the event. A total solar eclipse for many is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And Indigenous cultures have unique perspectives on the celestial phenomenon. Just a time to like sit and, and reflect about that and, and think about it and, and our lives and you know, the, the roles that we play, our, our purpose here. Some Indigenous nations believe the eclipse is an intimate time between sun and moon as they are in a sacred union giving birth to new life on Earth. Benina Bonnet works to preserve Indigenous astronomical knowledge at McMaster University. This is a Dene belief of the Big Dipper of a creation story. The Big Dipper for this particular constellation is his vessel, so he's holding it like this, like like his vessel, like his, and all the knowledge and flora and fauna of the world are coming out of it to the people. Some tribes won't watch the event, like some Navajo people. It's a time when you are to stay inside and you're supposed to reflect. It's a time of renewal and uh, if to go outside can cause misfortune. It is believed the sun is undergoing a rebirth. 
and some Indigenous people, out of respect, will not be watching it. It's a very sort of sacred moment. I think I would rather feel it than actually look at it. While other nations will be celebrating and teaching their young ones about the sky and its many wonders. If you're going to watch this rare and amazing event, you must protect your eyes with glasses like these. I purchased them online. Donna Sound, CTV News, Hamilton, Ontario. After the break, building blocks and Lego landscapes at Newfoundland's biggest museum. That's next. It's Lego Week in Newfoundland and Labrador. The province's biggest museum, known as The Rooms in St. John's, is celebrating the Danish toy in all its glory, showcasing impressive Lego expertise and also allowing the public to come on in and build their own creations. CTV's Garrett Berry reports. Open to beginners and seasoned creators. Probably since I was like four. This week, it's a love affair with the Lego. There's daily themes like transportation, giving kids lots to think about. A plane. A plane? And what makes a good Lego plane? Of course, some follow their own imaginations. So this is an x-ray spot. Okay. And over here is where they take a bath. And this is the waiting room. I'm making a hammer to try to help me build some other things. On display, some faithful renderings of this city's most iconic buildings, made by Newfoundland's own LEGO user group. A 9,000-piece version of the Basilica. It looks super hard to bake. Or this LEGO painting of the colorful houses of downtown St. John's. One of the main comments I heard from families, parents all this week, and grandparents is, this isn't the LEGO I grew up with, because people are taking it and doing their own thing and spinning their own creativity. There's also a communal work. Everybody who visits gets to place one piece. It's not what you might expect at a public museum, but staff here say it's all about looking at your surroundings a little bit slower. We want people, when they leave our building, for it to change their, their journey home and see life, even the mundane parts of life, in a new and interesting way. And Lego kind of forces you to slow down and think. The event wraps up this weekend just in time for kids to head back to school on Monday. Care Perry, CTV News, St. John's. Love Lego. That's it for us tonight. I'm Todd Vander Hayden. Heather Butts is back here tomorrow night. From all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching and have a great rest of your weekend. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.